Welcome to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. This week, we're going to look at scriptures from Proper 15. Proper 15. Now, those scriptures are in your post. You see them listed there. What I recommend is that you look at them on a daily basis, if possible. A lot of times, I'm not able to do that myself. So what I'll do is I'll uh, catch up. So I might have a couple of, maybe two, three days to catch up with. But the important part and point is that you and I will read them and reflect on them. If you can give yourself some time to think about them and to reflect on them, that's a very, very positive thing. I also mentioned the possibility of doing some additional work by looking at a study Bible. The ESV has an excellent study Bible. You look at the notes at the bottom, they give you some information. Now that particularly comes in handy when we are looking at the scriptures this week from 2 Samuel 17, 18, 19, and 23. These are not easy chapters. There's lots of dialogue. I am not going to spend a lot of time on giving you the dialogue and going through the the major uh, sections because it would take way too long. Because as you see, again, in your post, We have Acts 22, Acts 23, Acts 24, and Acts 25. We uh, are dealing with Paul and Paul's problems when he came into Jerusalem, came back. The Holy Spirit told him, uh, you know, yes, but be careful. Uh, The people that he was with and dealing with before he went to Jerusalem did not want him to go back to Jerusalem. He felt led by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He got into big trouble, and we're watching that process. And then in our gospel reading, we are dealing with Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 11 and 12 and 13. Second Samuel 17, 1 to 23. Now, all of this started when David and Bathsheba got together earlier in 2 Samuel, and committed adultery. Uh, The son died. The husband to Bathsheba died. Um, David had him killed at the front in a fighting battle. And then the consequences of David's sin against God was very serious, and it affected his family. So that's the background to the readings this week in the Old Testament. Again, this is a history book. And there's lots of, again, there's lots of verses, there's lots of dialogue, there's a lot that's, that's going on. And because of our time constrictions, we'd, I'm just going to uh, help you through it very quickly and just take your time and read it. Lots of verses to read. You may want to fill in with verses that are not listed in the reading if you are following this sequentially in your Bible. Second Samuel chapter 17 has to deal with Athiphanel and Absalom, Athiphanel, and Absalom, okay? Uh, And so you want to read that section and notice what is happening here. Look at what happened in verse 23, which is the last verse. Then Athiphanel saw that his advice had not been followed. He saddled his donkey, set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. Wow. Wow. So in those first 22 verses, what happened? So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. He died and was buried in his father's tomb. David went to Mahanam, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Absalom had appointed Amasa over the army in place of Joab. Amasa was the son of a man named Jethor, etc. When David came uh, in verse 27, he brought bedding and bowls and articles of pot- pottery. They also brought wheat and barley, flour, roasted grain, beans and lentils, honey, curds and sheep, and cheese from cow's milk for David and his people to eat. For they said, the people have become hungry and tired and thirsty in the desert. And so this extraordinary situation regarding his lineage is happening. And this is just a terrible sequence of events that we find here. In chapter 18, which is uh, in your post, you you see on Monday and Tuesday, you see the death of Absalom is going to finally occur. And in verse 19, we have the beginning of David mourning about it, very sad about it, Uh, very uh, tragic news that 
Absalom is going to die. And we see this very famously in verse 33. The king was shaken. He goes up to his room over the gateway and weeps as he went. He says, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Now, this is what Nathan, remember, Nathan goes to David with the sin of Bathsheba and tells him what God is going to do. Now, David, to his credit, repents before the Lord, but then the consequences are meted out in these chapters following that you're now having to read. And we see all the consequences of the failure to honor God and to follow God in a holy, godly, righteous lifestyle. And what that does to your prodigy, what that does to your family, what that does to your kingdom, what that does uh, as a leader. And we continue in chapter 19, Joab verse 1, the king is weeping, mourning for Absalom. The whole army, and for the whole army, the victory that day had turned into mourning. So again, David is successful uh, in chapter 18, but Absalom dies. The king is grieving for his son. The men stole into the city. That day as men steal in who are ashamed when they flee from battle, the king covered his face and cried aloud, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Okay. David then returns to Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the Israelites had fled their homes throughout the tribes of Israel, verse 9. The people were all arguing. The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies. He's the one who rescued, rescued us from the hand of the Philistines. But now he's fled the country because of Absalom. Remember, Absalom is trying to kill him, but Absalom dies. And Absalom, who we anointed to rule over us, has died in battle. So why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? And so in this tremendous uh, chapter, chapter 19, just read this very slowly and you'll see all that transpires uh, in terms of setting the kingdom right. We go into, and now we skip over into chapter 23. So you've got 20 and 21 and 22. In chapter 22, let me just quickly say, David praises the Lord. Those of you that turn to this in your Bibles, it's not listed in your daily lectionary reading on the post, but you may want to look at this. When the Lord delivered him from the hands of his enemies and from the hand of Saul, he's still praising the Lord, even though much tragedy has happened to him. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. So we, were, we are looking for the Lord to save us. We are looking for the Lord uh, that is lifted up high. So to be our rear guard, to be our rock, to be our fortress, to be the one that we take refuge. Now, Remember, David is a m very complex person because he has this great relationship with God. He's a fantastic warrior, but he's also got problems like all of us do uh, with dealing with sin and doing things that we shouldn't do, things that God would not be pleased with. That 22nd chapter, by the way, is quite fantastic. It's a beautiful chapter about the Lord. In chapter 23, we see the last words of David. Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, when one rules over men in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, this is verse 3 of chapter 23, he is like the light of morning at sunrise in a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings the grass from the earth. Is not my house right with God? Has he not made with me an everlasting covenant, arranged and secured in every part? So he lists the mighty men of God. And uh, then we have 13 to 17, um, the listing of the men and the continued work of the Lord and the continued work of God through King David. And then we will pick up with uh, chapter 24, where he, when he finally, uh, he is going to pass away um, in chapter 24. And we'll see that next week when uh, we have uh, chapter 24 in proper 16. Actually, uh, uh, he does not pass away there. 
He is going to pass away when we go into 1 Kings. Uh, chapter 24 is a wonderful chapter about how God uh, deals with him uh, and how David, uh, again, just a very, very smart guy uh, and figures out exactly what to do. We'll look at that next time. In Acts 22, where we left Paul, Acts 22, where we left Paul, verse 30. The next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul, why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. So Paul is going to look at the Sanhedrin in chapter 23, verse 1. My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. Now remember there's a tete-a-tete -tete here. Remember David had a problem because of his sin with Bathsheba, the pronouncement of judgment by God, and then as we work through uh, the end of uh, 2 Samuel and the beginning of 1 Kings, when he's eventually going to pass away, uh, he's just dealing uh, with continuing to fight, continuing to fight his battles, continuing to defend Israel, but also dealing with his family that's run amok. In this particular section here, Paul is dealing with the Jewish leaders who want to kill him. The Jewish leaders do not like Paul at all. He went to the other side, or they would say the dark side. He was on the right side, which in fact, Jesus called him out in Acts chapter 9 and said, why are you persecuting me? And Paul was dramatically changed that day. So he is looking at the Sanhedrin and he is speaking to them. Verse 11, the following the night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you will testify in Rome, which was a very strong thing for the Lord to say to Paul. Of course, the Lord is the one that made that happen. And of course, it did happen. The plot to kill Paul in 12 to 24, that's our Tuesday reading. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. See what I'm saying? They want to kill him. And they would have killed him under normal circumstances, but the God of Israel was on his side. More than 40 people were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we've taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we've killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petitioned the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But the son of Paul's sister, the son of Paul's sisters heard of the plot, told Paul, Paul called the centurion and who went to the commander and they arranged for Paul to be transferred to the coast, to Caesarea. Again, fun reading, chapter 23 to the end of 23, okay? Again, much like 2 Samuel, lots of reading, long text, takes a while to get through it to see what's going on, all right? Enjoy that reading of chapter 23. We pick up with Paul in chapter 24 with his trial before Felix. Okay, now so... Paul is having to defend himself. And this may be one of the reasons that Luke has these, um, these occurrences in his um, Acts of the Apostles, is that Paul is defending the gospel and defending himself before all these different groups of people. In fact, he's going to appear before Festus in 25, and then he will appear before Agrippa in 26. We will see that next week in chapter uh, in proper 16. So he says, for example, in verse 16 of chapter 24, he says, I've always strived to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Now, Paul is a very, very, very significant person in the Bible, as all of you know, I'm sure. And so his being preserved so that he can fill it he can visit these churches and write these epistles is very important. If he dies young, we've got a tremendous loss in our hands. Watch this in the end of 20, uh, 24, 27. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So Paul is, has been there for several years now. And then in 25, he appears 
before Festus now. So Felix, then Festus, then King Agrippa. And we go all the way to 25, 13 to 27, where he appears before Agrippa. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the conference room. He had told Festus in 22 that he wanted to hear him speak. What has he got to say? In in 11 of chapter 25, he appeals to Caesar. So they're going to oblige him, and they're going to send him to Caesar, who is obviously in Rome. Now, the whole Jewish community had petitioned him, in verse 24, about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. So the Jews were against him, and the Romans were protecting him. Paul had appealed to Caesar, and so it was up to Festus, then Felix, then King Agrippa. It was up to Festus to make sure that he was going to get to Caesar. The whole Jewish community had petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, something that he ought not to live any longer. I found that he had done nothing deserving of death. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like Pontius Pilate and Jesus. But because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. So he's going to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. I think it is unreasonable, verse 27 of chapter 25, to send on a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. So when we come together again next time, we will look at what King Agrippa says. So what we have here in chapter 22, 23, 24, and 25 is Paul has been saved, literally saved, by the Romans because the Jews were going to kill him. He goes in hiding at night to Caesarea. He's kept under guard. He speaks to the Sanhedrin. The Jews are trying to kill him. He's a dangerous person. They do protect him. And now he's making his way to Rome because he has appealed to Caesar. And if you as a Roman citizen appeal to Caesar, then Caesar shall you go. Very interesting and very good stuff. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Now, Last time, we saw that Jesus approached Jerusalem. And he, this is the Palm Sunday event. And he is moving to Jerusalem because he needs to go there to die. That is the reason he's going to Jerusalem, as I'm sure all of you know. So then he goes to the temple and he cleanses the temple because they are not treating the temple right. They are not taking care of God's house of his father's house. Of course, they don't know him as the son of God. They don't believe at all. But then we have this great verse, series of verses in 12 to 26 about that, okay? Then we have the withered fig tree, another beautiful incident. And Jesus says, have faith in God, verse 22 of chapter 11. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, believes that What he says will happen and will be done for him. For I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. This is a great teaching about forgiveness. They question his authority at the end of chapter 11. In chapter 12, he tells them the the strong parable of the parable of the tenants, which is a parable about the leadership in Israel and how they wanted to kill even the son. What is the owner of the vineyard going to do? Because they're going to kill the heir in verse 7 of chapter 12. They took him, they killed him, they threw him out of the vineyard. What does the owner of the vineyard do? God Almighty. He's going to come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. The others are going to be eventually the Gentiles. They look for a way to arrest him in verse 12. You say, why did they just kill Jesus? Because they knew it had spoken the parable against him, but they were afraid of the crowd. The crowd was very important in that time, and they were waiting for a more opportune moment. And as you know, they got it when Judas betrayed Jesus. We are in 12, 13, the the wonderful paying taxes to Caesar. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus 
famously answered in verse 17, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, or as I like to say the King James, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And the Bible says they were amazed at him. They questioned him about the, uh, and they're trying to trip him up. These people are not interested in hearing the word of the Lord. They're not interested in doing the word of the Lord. They don't want to know what Jesus Christ has to say about anything. They're trying to have a very good reason to have him killed. But it's not easy to kill him because they have to get permission from the Romans and they have to, and they're scared of the people. So why don't they just go do it themselves? Because the people will rise up against them. So they need to figure out a way to kill him that's palatable for him and safe for them. The greatest commandment in the midst of all this, of all the commandments, which is the most important? This is the teachers of the law come and ask him this question. The most important one is this. Verse 29 of chapter 12. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And that is the truth. They ask him more academic questions and trying to trap him. Uh, whose son is the Christ? Uh, concerning David and some language in the Psalms. And then at the end of the chapter 12, we have the famous widow's might who put all that she had and Jesus says in verse 43, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live. You'll see in your post that our last day, Saturday, is chapter 13 of Mark 1 to 13, and that has to do with signs at the end of the age, and we go through 13. It's a very famous chapter. Verse 13 of 13. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So a lot of things are going to happen, and there will be signs at the end of the age. People will hate you, but if you hold firm to the end, it's going to be, you're going to be saved. So Jesus had an understanding of Israel's past. He had an understanding of what he was there presently to do. And then in chapter 13, and we'll pick this up next week, he has an understanding of what the future looks like. So this man is living in the past, present, and future simultaneously. He knows his past. He knows what's happening in the future. He knows everything that's preceded him, and he knows what the future is going to look like. So we have three processes going on right now as we look at the books of 2 Samuel, the book of Acts, and the book of Mark. Much is going on with David, as I've repeatedly said uh, today. Much is going on with Paul, and much is going on with Jesus. So I hope that you enjoy uh, the, uh, traveling with them and journeying with them and seeing what God is going to do with, with David and with Paul and with Jesus. And we'll pick up each of those stories next week in Proper 16. God bless you, and have a wonderful time of reading and prayer.